a very important goal for many people, if not most people, is to retire. As a matter of fact, it occupies the minds of individuals to the extent that where they oftentimes choose to work is where they can retire the soonest. The joke has been made for many years now that Americans will never be satisfied until they can retire at 28. And that's after working 25-hour week before. And in many respects, that seems to be just exactly what a lot of people would like to have happen. It occupies their minds. Where they plan on going, what they plan on accomplishing when they retire, how they're going to see the world, or just more or less biding their time until the opportunity they get to really live and to retire. And there's nothing wrong with that. But sadly, I'm afraid that that concept of retirement maybe has sneaked over into an area in which at least we need to question whether it's possible to retire from everything. Wives, will you let your husbands retire from being married to you? Well, most realize that that's not something you retire from. And most of us would recognize there are various responsibilities that we have. I mean, I've never heard of a grandpa retiring from being a grandpa of you. No. But is it possible for us to retire from the Lord's work? You see, that's where oftentimes people have the tendency to think that it's possible to just stop, to no longer do, and to, in actuality, retire from the Lord's work. The fact is, the only way that we could retire from the Lord's work is to cease being able to do the Lord's work. And many times, the only way that we're ever going to be able to cease from doing the Lord's work is when we pass from this earthly existence. Then, of course, we'll have to. We'll be forced into retirement then. But, of course, we have the assurance that our works do follow us even into eternity. Retirement. Maybe this is a good reason for us to look at what the wise man said in the psalm that was our devotional reading a few months ago. Because what he said concerning older age, and I realize that that's sort of stepping on people's souls, but, but that is something that we all hope to reach one of these days, I hope. And when it comes to the matter of old age, then that is a relative term. None of us will ever be as ancient as Methuselah. As a matter of fact, I don't know if I would want to be 969 years old unless I could keep my health until I was 960. Then maybe so. Or at least my brain. Or maybe a part of the thing. But is it possible for us to learn insight into what God thinks about advanced age and our responsibility to God from what the Scripture says relative to this matter of contributing to the cause of God even at an advanced age. Now, we know for a fact that sometimes there are physical infirmities that place us in a position where we can no longer do what we once could, you know. Very few people, now some people think they can, some people talk like they can, but very few people at the age of 70 can do actually what they could do when they were 20. That just doesn't happen very often at all. And while we can take care of our physical selves to a great extent and maybe do better than the rest of the people in the world that are not taking care of themselves, then most of us run down to the point where we do not have the same abilities, the same strengths physically that we did when we were younger. As a matter of fact, it's also so that sometimes we don't have the great ability to sing at an advanced age that we did when we were younger. Our voices end up leaving us. Our range ends up leaving us. Of course, some have recognized that that range went along with weight, and when weight started leaving, the range started leaving. Now, I remember 
Rachel Franklin said that a few years ago. And so those abilities that we once had, we know for a fact that just in the passion of time and the way that our physical bodies have the tendency to wear out physically, then some of the things that we would like to be able to do, we can't always do. And it's from that respect that there are some things then we might have to retire from doing as far as the Lord's work is concerned. It wasn't that many years ago that I actually crawled up on top of Tony's house with his brothers and helped roof his house. Boy, that'll never happen again. No way. I'd hate to think I had to crawl up on top of that table, much less time to go on the roof of the house and try to... So we understand that principle. But say that we do have our physical abilities for the most part, Say that we do have maybe 90% of our minds still left. Does God let us off at a certain age? There's something else that I've noticed in my short lifetime, and that is that some people have the concept of spirituality as if it's something that you can just grab a hold of when you happen to reach an age and retire from a physical work, and now you can focus on more important things now that you don't have anything else to do. Well, that's not the correct way to view that either. Because most of the time, and while there are exceptions, most of the time, the little old lady that is a godly little old lady didn't start off being a godly little old lady when she hit 65. As a matter of fact, before she got even close to 65, she was a godly middle-aged lady. And she might even been a godly young adult. That may be in an adult class somewhere, young adult class. And might even have started off even before that as a teenager. So that natural progression does happen too. Can we retire from the Lord's work? Well, our devotional reading a few moments ago tells us very plainly just exactly what we would naturally expect and what the Lord expects out of those who have reached an advanced age. <clears throat> Notice the words that he uses here. He describes the righteous, and of course this is encompassing more than just those who would be older, but he pictures the righteous as being flourishing like palm trees, growing like cedars in Lebanon. And of course that idea is the strength that goes along with those types of trees and those types of environments. And then in verse 13, those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of God. Now here the picture is, is that while we would think, naturally so, in some physical settings, certain trees would do better. Remember the first psalm, planted by the Rivers of water bringing forth fruit in the season. That's because there's plenty of water there to make the tree grow. Well, here, God pictures His trees, His men and women, His son and daughters, as being planted in His house. And those that are His children and are planted in His house They've got the very best environment there is for growing. As a matter of fact, they can't help but grow because they are where they will get all of the nutrition that they need to be strong, flowering plants. Or even better, strong, faithful children of God, even though they may have celebrated a large number of birthdays. By design, God knows that. Notice verse 14 in particular. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat. Somebody says, see, I knew it. I knew it was going to happen sooner or later. The Scriptures went and pegged me. No, the idea here of fat is flourishing healthy, despite the old age, they are still vital. They are still able to produce. And it doesn't take away from the fact 
that they are old, that they are in the right place and able to produce as God designs for them to produce. So, I think we could draw the conclusion then, just from these few verses of Scripture in the book of Psalms, that God not only thinks that older people can produce fruit, He actually expects them to. And then when I look not only at a specific reference to such a thing as that here in the psalm, but I also look at the various individuals throughout the Old as well as the New Testament who reached a rather advanced age, but were still held very responsible for what they had the ability to do and were held responsible above and beyond some who might have been considered half their age and maybe even a whole lot stronger. Let's look at a few of those examples and see if the point does not come through that God not only expects, but He demands that older people as well be faithful because of the numerous older people that God has used in a very wonderful way throughout the history of mankind. Consider first the great lawgiver of Israel. His name, of course, is Moses. Moses and his partner, good old Aaron, who happened to be his older brother, two and a half to three years older than Moses. You remember that when Moses came to years, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now that's what Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 and 25 tells us. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years. Well, how old was that? He was 40. But wait a minute. When he was 40 and he came to years and he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and made a, ch a choice on that occasion that caused him to have to leave Egypt and go into the land of Midian and work for who would soon become his father-in-law, a man by the name of Jethro, and would end up marrying his daughter, Zipporah, that then by the time he came back to Egypt, he's how old? Sort of long in the tooth, wasn't he? He's 80. Well, anybody knows an 80 year old man can't lead the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage? That's a job for a young man. Well, God didn't know that. Because Moses and his brother Aaron, a pretty good team, with Aaron for his spokesman, for his prophet, was sent back to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. At 80 and 83 years, mind you, then I realized that what would translate today to their age may not be that, you know. But I do not think that they were still teenagers. At 80, they may have been more comparable to 60 or to 50, but they certainly were not teenagers. They certainly were not 20 years old. And God expected them to be the leaders of His people, not only the lawgiver, but also the first high priest of the children of Israel as they were delivered from Egyptian bondage at the ages of 80 and 83. That must mean something. As a matter of fact, there is a psalm that is attributed to Moses. And that psalm is the 90th psalm. And in that 90th psalm, we hear Moses making statements relative to man's advanced age being 80, and yet with those 80 years, there's increased sorrows, for we're soon cut off and we fly away. And most people, even before they reach that advanced stage, can tell you about the difficulties that go along with advanced ages. So our first examples would serve here to prove the case would be Moses and his brother Aaron. Well, what about two more co contemporaries of that time frame that would also be classified properly as older guys for sure? Remember when Moses chose spies, one from each tribe, to send into the land of Canaan to spy out the land. 
send them in to the land of Canaan from Kadesh Barnea. And when the twelve spies came back, all the spies brought an evil report except for two. And the two who brought back a report that didn't, you know, didn't try to convince anybody there wasn't giants in the land, didn't try to convince anybody that they didn't have wild seeds, didn't try to convince them of anything that would lessen the impact of how difficult it was going to be. But the two faithful spies were older guys too. Their names, of course, were Joshua and Caleb. And they just happened to be the only ones of their generation who got to go into the land of Canaan. Because the rest of them wandered in the wilderness until they died. Would God use them as an example in their advanced age? Well, yes, He would. We know that for the last 30 years of Joshua's life, he was the leader of the children of Israel. He took Moses' place when he was how old? When he was 80. There's a stuck on this number here of 80. It seems like that 80 years is by far not anything for us to think that when one is advanced beyond that, then they're not any use to the Lord. Because here we know for a fact that Joshua was that old as well. And the example that we have in Joshua chapter 14, verses 6 through 12, is that Caleb, when they went into the land of Canaan, and when they were dividing up the land among the various tribes, there were some of the younger fellows who were jockeying for position for choice of territory that would not be that difficult to overtake. In other words, if you have already been fighting in the army of Joshua these years when they were breaking the backs of the strongholds among the Canaanites, then you would know pretty well the places are going to be more difficult and the places that were going to be relatively easy. And some of them were requesting some of the easier places, some of the lowlands, but certainly not any of the mountain places. But it was Caleb who for some reason said, I'm just as strong now as I was 40 years ago. Give me the hardest land, and it will surely be ours. Did he really have the physical stamina that he had 40 years previously? I don't know. But I guarantee you one thing. Just because he was 40 years older now did not in any way diminish his faith that if God said this land is yours for the taking, Caleb thought God meant what he said. And he served an example for the rest of them that they should have followed his example instead of trying to look for an easy way out. Another man that we read about in the Old Testament that most people's minds do not look at him as being old at no time in his life. Even though he lived during the reign of at least five different kings, which means he had to live more than just a little while, most of the time when we picture this man, we see him as probably 16, 17 year old sitting in amongst the line. But was he really that old when he was amongst the line? Well, we know this for a fact, that when he was in the lines then, he had already served as one of the three governors of the land of Babylon. We know that he was in the reign of Darius and Cyrus the Persians. We know that he already reigned in the uh, reign with Cyrus and reigned with Belshazzar, and he was 80 years old. You mean Daniel in the lion's den was 80 years old? We was in the lion's den? Well, I guess he's such an advanced age that he might as well go ahead and be eaten by the lions. He's not really much use to anybody else anyhow, is he? That's not the way that God looks on him, is he? And certainly we don't look at him that way either. And then come over to the New Testament. 
There was a couple that was childless. Their names were Zechariah and Elizabeth. You know them to be the parents of John the Immerser. And I like the term that's used in the King James Version in Luke chapter 1 at verse 7. It says concerning Zacharias and Elizabeth that they were well stricken in years. And I'm starting to understand a whole lot more about that stricken in years. The pain that goes along with of, of years. How did you hurt in places you didn't even know you had the older you get? But yet here was a couple who did not have children, and yet, while they were well stricken in years, Zacharias was still day in and day out in the temple serving. And not only that, his wife Elizabeth did give birth to John the Immerser. Somebody says, no, I don't even want to think about that. Just go ahead and get away from that idea of advanced age and well stricken in years and now I'm going to have a child. And yet, here's another example. In the New Testament this time, when the length of life has shrunk a whole lot by this time, and yet these are people who at advanced age are being able to serve God remarkably well. In Luke chapter 2, verses 27, beginning, we read of two older people who were waiting on the coming of the Christ child. The man's name was Simeon, and the woman's name was Anna. Anna was 84 years old, and she had been serving the Lord with fastings and prayer, <clears throat> excuse me, night and day for years. And they were simply waiting on, the, they desired to see the coming of the Christ, and their life would be complete. And lest we overlook one of the more significant ones, in the ninth verse of the book of Philemon, we read where the writer of this short epistle identifies himself as Paul the Aged. Paul the Aged. Sounds like to me he's saying that he's old. Older, compared to the speaking. And yet, while Paul the Aged is writing this epistle to Philemon, he at the same time is in prison and writing the rest of the prison epistles at that time. Far from retiring from the Lord's work, he is active in pursuit of strengthening the Lord's church through the resources that he has available to him. Would it be proper then for us to look at these examples and say that here are at least a few individuals who in their golden years didn't think that meant painted up? and doing something else. But were those who saw that they could still bring forth fruit in old age. But in what ways? Very briefly, look at some examples. There will always be a need for elders. Elders. Older. Elders. Is it any wonder then that we would see that the leadership of congregations is reserved for those who have a certain amount of spiritual maturity that allows them the prerogative to make decisions on behalf of the saints with under their watch care? Sure. Therefore, that is a role and a purpose that can be fulfilled not by just anybody, but by those who are, by definition, older. But yet, how many times has it happened that when a person is to the age where they now could start serving as an elder, they are at the same time maybe fixing to retire from a secular job, and so they don't have any time to serve the Lord now. Which, to me, appears to be sort of the reverse of what ought to be taking place. Someone says, well, we're not prepared. Well, it's a funny thing to me that we can send a young man to a preacher training school for two or three years and expect him to pick up enough of ammunition and sermons and wisdom that he'll be able to deal with brethren both far and near in just about any circumstance, but yet older and wiser heads could not receive instruction as well to assist them in the overseeing of the work of a local congregation. I beg to differ. There's always going to be a need for older women. It might startle some women to realize, 
But the way God designed it, it's for older women to teach younger women. And a part of that which older women are to teach younger women, according to Titus chapter 2, is what it means to love your husband and what it means to love your children and what it means to be a keeper of your home and what it means to live a discreet life before the outside world. As we've oftentimes stated, it should be the case that older women tell younger women that which younger preachers don't even have to mention from the pulpit. But if it's not mentioned, then it has to be mentioned at some point, does it not? There will always be a need, even those who do not have the physical capacity to do much of anything, but to do things like call on the phone or send cards or fix food that can be taken to the funeral home. I know there's going to be a meeting even today about that good work that can be done by so many and is done by so many and accomplishes so many wonderful, wonderful things. Those who are willing to prepare themselves to do good do not need to waste their talents just because they reach some chronological age that they think now allows them to be excluded from the work of the local church. As we've noticed in our examination in previous weeks in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and how that the church is like a physical body. And there's no such thing as an inferiority complex that should be felt by anyone within the congregation. Just as there should be no such thing as a superiority con- concept anyhow that's had by anyone within the congregation. But as we weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice, both young and old, male and female, then the greatest good is accomplished by the greatest number. That's the way God designed it from the beginning, and that is the way that will continue to bring forth honor and glory to our God that is in heaven. It may be that our audience this evening, there's one or more that has never obeyed the simple commands of the gospel. If that be the case, then at this moment in your life, the Scriptures describe you as being lost without God and without hope in this world. Since that's the way the Scriptures describe such a person, then that's the way that we need to look at ourselves. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, there were at least 3,000 who were willing to see themselves as they really were. They were in need of the gospel because they had contributed to the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And as they cried out to Peter and the rest of the apostles and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? It was Peter that responded, Repent to be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Those that gladly received His Word were baptized. And there were added to them that day about 3,000 souls. Have you obeyed that simple gospel plan? Have you in times past done just that, but have wandered away and need to be restored? We stand ready to assist you as well. If you'll let us know your wishes while together we stand and while we sing.